so when I started basically writing things down to doing this talk, I kind of realized that I could only confuse myself if I tried to put down everything I knew. Uh, so I've called this part one of three. I think there are another two parts somewhere for maybe next year and the year after, but uh, I started off with part one, which in my knowledge, in my kind of experience is going to be the the thing that's going to give you the biggest boost, but probably the thing that you're not going to read or do at university. You're not going to read about it too much or do it at university. So hopefully this will be potentially new. It won't be new for, for a few people here, but they can bear with me. Okay, so just to start with, how many active are you? How many would say, how many people here would say they've come like a novice? Oh, right. So, this, this, that's okay, so I don't think this talk's really going to kind of bog you down with, with art. Uh, although there will be some art, and quite a bit of art, to be honest, and we'll see what it can do. Uh, how many people have ever done predictive modelling? Right, so has anyone never done predictive modelling? Okay, that's okay, no worries. Okay, so let's go with part one of three. So, first of all, a uh, bit of an introduction about me and art. So, as you've all said, you probably introduced me to it uh, probably four years ago. Uh, first thing, when people, uh, when, I, when I do competitions, they assume I'm a, data, uh, a computer scientist or a statistician, and I'll tell you now I'm not. I kind of, my education is engineering, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, and when I was thinking about what that means, I don't know if this is true, but I kind of think of an engineer is a different mindset. He's got a problem looking for a solution. So what you will see, I've got a problem to solve, and I don't know whether it's R or anything. You know, I've got to find a solution to that problem. Uh, and essentially my PhD was looking at intelligent controllers, heating systems, and as a, as a kind of solution, a bit of the jigsaw to solve that problem, I had to learn programming. I had to learn about algorithms, you know, so I, had to, I picked up those tools because I needed them to solve that problem. And, I, and you might see that theme through kind of my, my talk. It's not, I'm not a statistician, I'm not, I'm not a theory guy. I'm a, I, I believe in uh, the, the proof the pudding's in the eating, yeah. So I want to see the answers. I don't want someone to prove, I don't want someone to give me a fancy algorithm and a theory. I want to actually see the, see the evidence. Uh, so, as, you, as you've all said, I developed my own software, started my PhD in 94, looking at basically neural networks, because that was the buzzword at the time. September 2009, which is only four years ago, literally this month, last month, that's when I started to learn art. Now, the reason I, the reason I did that, I started a competition, there was there's an Oz, Oz, OSDM conference, that's the one. And I suggested, I had a problem I wanted to actually solve, it was a real, Problem to the algorithms. I thought, well, I'm not a mathematician. I'll, suck, I'll create a competition and let everyone else solve it for me, so I get to know the answer. And, and what I did with that competition, I used it as a, a training ground to actually learn on myself to try and solve the problem. And I kind of set up a, uh, a kind of web for, a forum where I said, this is what I'm doing. I, I know nothing about R. And by the end of the two weeks or whatever, I kind of probably pretty frustrated about. Are being a steep learning curve, uh, but since then, you know, it's practice, pra practice makes perfect. Although I'm no far from perfect. Uh, so my initial reason for wanting to learn R was uh, I used to write my own algorithms, but you know, there's only so much you can do. I thought, well, there's a bunch of people here writing them for me. I'll, I'll just use R and piggyback off theirs. Uh, but now I'm finding a lot. I do. I just used, used to use it for algorithms. Now. I'm actually, and, and I do used to do my data prep in SQL. Now I'm finding that I'm doing all my data prep in, in R as well, uh, and kind of that's my main tool. So I use use R daily. I'm currently working for a hedge fund, and yeah, it's perfect. Uh, as I said, just use the I put, put together the bits of the jigsaw to solve the problem I need, and you know, I've not yet come across anything that that's, I said. Well, I can't do this. Uh, I need another tool, <clears throat> not yet. So as Eugene said, 
I've won three paddle competitions and quite won quite a lot. Not, that's not all my money. I think that's a pretty big team, so I get a small small proportion of that. But the, the, the main thing here is that I've actually spent zero dollars on software. I bought a kind of pretty beefy computer. It was only fifteen hundred dollars, uh, so it's quite a good return. And I talked to Eugene about this later. That you know, it's not about what you spend; it's about how you approach the problem. So that's my analyst's first plug. <laughs> okay. So new R four years never developed an R package. Don't know why I need to uh, because I just get things to work without actually needing to do a package. And I just wonder where to start. But I guess if I wanted to develop one, I'd just go and read it and, and figure it out. And now my code's probably, if, you, if there's any purists among you, you'll look at my code and think I'm a bit of a cowboy. Uh, but I don't care, you know. I just wanted to do, I just wanted to do the results. And then when I, when I find a solution, I'll, you know, if it needs to be productionized, maybe go and code it properly in some other language or some other applications. Uh, okay. Now, final page on me and R. So, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want. Really don't mind connect, happy to connect to anyone, quite sociable. But yeah, don't just keep the standard LinkedIn message because I get thousands of them and kind of don't read most of them. Uh, I also run a data analytics Australia LinkedIn group, so that's more of a who's who in data analytics in Australia. And final plug uh, if, you, if you can use R and you're looking for work, or your employer and you need a data scientist, just, just let me know, because I'm always being asked by people, who knows, who do you know who's got these skills? Uh, I'm always being asked by people, I've got these skills, do you know anyone who's got any jobs going? So, I might be able to help you out. Okay, so what is predicted modeling? I'll, I'll, I'll rattle through this, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about what we mean by predicted modeling. Saying we're trying to design an engine, uh, and we want an engine that delivers a certain power output. Now, we can configure that engine in various ways, so there's various engine variables in our design. Now, what will happen is we'll, we'll tell some physicist uh, we want this power output, uh, how, what size do I need the cylinders, the pistons, you know, what, what, what temperature I need to burn the fuel at, and he will go away and go to his first law of thermodynamics, he'll tell you exactly the design, yeah? Because you know, God has decided these materials have got certain properties, they will behave definitely like that, yeah? So he will tell you, he, he gives all these equations. It's not modeling, it's why he's modeling, yeah? So when, when he retires, we're left with a bit of a problem because he was our expert. So over the years, we've accumulated all that data We've been testing our engine with, with sensors and things, and what we can we, we now don't know what the, these laws of nature are because our physicist is gone. So what we can actually do is take the raw values and, and what the, what power it delivered, and then we want some way of say mapping these <coughs> into this one to come with an equation that emulates the laws of nature. Yeah, and that would be a predictive model. So then you can use that model to predict the power output with, with, with various settings. Now, most things you want to predict uh, basically involve humans, and humans belong to themselves. You know, then you can't really predict uh, what they're going to do. So, so God only knows what humans will do. So, what we need to do there, there's no laws of nature to go by. So, we will, you know, take historical information uh, and basically try to map the variables onto the output we're trying to predict. So in the Heritage Health Prize it was trying to predict how many days in hospital someone will spend based on a lot of information about that person uh, from the prior year. And we'll try and find an equation that maps one to the other. And it's, it's not perfect because it's not going to predict every single person the exact answer, but it's going to be saying people like you generally do this, but you might be the exception. So, fortunately, some clever people who know a lot of maths have come up with some, some algorithms for us. So we throw in uh, some historical variables, whether it be a, things we've measured about that person, 
uh, and there might be some rubbish in there, it might be uh, what you had for breakfast, how big your feet are, and then we will say what the outcome was, and we've got to come up with a relationship that using these predicts that, using uh, a set of algorithms. Now, there are lots of them out there, so uh, I probably assume most of you are uh, familiar with the few I've listed there. So they're algorithms that are, are packages in R, and someone's already done all the, the hard work for us. So then what happens when we get new patients, we take their, their conditions, stick it through the algorithm, and predict that in hospital for next year. Okay, so the point of this talk, how do you get the most accurate algorithms? And I'm gonna, there's a two kind of caveats here. We don't actually want to invent a new algorithm. We're not gonna invent a neural network or a GBM or, or whatever. We wanna get the most out of what's available for us. Yeah, so. Okay, now, we're gonna have a bit of fun here. Now, when we, ran, when we won the Heritage Health Prize, we kind of agreed to donate some money to charity. So now you're gonna help me donate some money to charity, okay? So the, the way this is gonna work, we're gonna have, one of you today is gonna to be crowned the Melbourne Predictive Modeling Champion. Yeah, if you, if you choose to, to take on the task. So what we're gonna do, you Val, where are you? And Eugene, can you stand up please? Now, you Val and Eugene this morning weigh themselves, all right? And your task today is to predict their, their combined weight. Yeah? Right? <coughs> so have a look at them. You know, your, your algorithm in your head will be going, oh, what do I weigh? Am I bigger than Eugene? Ooh, you know, uh, kind of thing. And, and adjusting and calibrating. Thinking, oh, were Eugene scales working this morning? And what's he had for lunch? Uh, so basically, have a look at you, you Val, have a look at Eugene, and think of a number. It's two decimal places in, in kilograms, right? Now, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna also make a guess, and for every person who's more accurate than me, I'll give $100 to charity, all right? So, I'm potentially up for five grand tonight, so try and get it as accurate as you can. Yeah? Is that, do you all know what you're gonna do? So I'm gonna pass around the laptop, it's just an extra spreadsheet, it's open office, type in your name, and you're guessing kilograms to two decimal places, and then by the time the talk's over, we'll find out who's the champion and how much I've got to give to charity. The charity, is, by the way, is the Cambodian Children's Trust, which looks after uh, unfortunate kids in Cambodia. Okay? So, Does this mean we can sit down there? you can sit down. Well, no, has everyone got the, got the model, built their algorithm? How many kilograms is this now? Uh, <laughs> he, he, he's a guy into a spreadsheet. Yeah. What about priming? Like, everyone's going to be seeing everyone else's numbers, well, so if someone gets it really wrong from the start, everyone will be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the objective is to raise as much money to the charity, so... So, try to overcome the bias of the <laughs> Yeah, so, start off with Jeremy. Just pass the laptop round and follow Jeremy's... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so moving on. Right, scenario here: you, you, you're working I don't know, at a, a marketing company, and you're trying to predict, I don't know, who's going to reply to my junk mail campaign. And you built three model, or four models. So this is an error, uh, and basically all you need to know is that a low error is better. So a random guess would give you 100, and I've got four. Uh, I've used four different algorithms. Uh, decision tree, very explainable, but not that accurate. Logistic regression, uh, very common needs to use. And GBM and random forest, uh, more accurate for this situation, but uh, not as interpretable now. Hands up here. Who, who would choose the G GBM? Yeah, go on. Who would choose random forest? GBM is. Yeah. Who would choose logistic regression? And who would choose a decision tree? No one. Okay. Now, uh, we'll come back to that again and we'll ask you the same question. Okay. Okay, right. So, I'm going to start with footy tipping. So, has anyone not done footy tipping? Does anyone not know what footy tipping is? Okay. Footy tipping is 
you've got basically got to pick who wins the footy game. Yeah? So you've got two teams, you score one point if you pick the winner, you score no points if you pick the loser. And at the end of the season, it's the person who's got the most points wins the competition. Uh, so, yeah, only two teams. Draw, in Aussie rules, draws are all but impossible. And just by random guessing, you would, because it's a you know, flip, flip of a coin, you, you'd actually get 50% correct. Uh, so, question here, how do we improve our footy tipping skills? So, what we're going to do is ask R. Now, if we're doing this, we probably need a whole bunch of data on footy tipping. Now, I don't have that, but I have R. Okay? So now, so, what I've done here in R, I'll sit down so I can drive it. I've just written some R code, and I'm trying to simulate a footy tipping competition. So, I don't want to kind of bog you down with the R code, but basically what it's doing, I've got some parameters up here that I'm setting for my simulations. So I've got number of tipsters, which is 12. So I've got 12 people in the competition. I've got number of games in the season, which is 200. And I'm going to simulate 100 seasons. Now, I've also got a tips to strength. So I'm setting 0.6. What I'm saying there is each of my tipsters is going to have got a 60% chance of getting the, the, the correct prediction. So at the end of the season, they're going to score 60%. Uh, so what I'm going to do is simulate a number of seasons. And also what I'm going to do uh, is the 12th tipster is going to be the majority vote of all the, the other 11. Yeah. So I've got 11 people picking ones and zeros. And the 12th will just go with the most popular choice. Of most popular, correct, yeah, basically most popular choice. So, if I just run that, hopefully you'll see what happens. Okay, so what, what have we got here? So, I've simulated 100 seasons, and each season is the percent of games you get correct out of the 200. So, the green line there is the 0.6, so every, every single tip's the should get 60% right. Now the blue line is, for each season I'll take the best tipster, yeah? And that's slightly above 0.6, basically because we've only got 200 games. When I expand that to 20,000, it will drop right down. Okay, so the red line there is, what's the red line? The red line is the majority vote. So that is, if I just show you the, the data, the results. What's <coughs> so this is one season. I, it looks like a bunch of ones and zeros, and it, and it is. But so this is game one, and I've randomly kind of set a one or a zero for each tipster, and these are the 200 games in the season. So if you're a one, you got it right. If you're a zero, you got it wrong. So for example, this game, my majority vote is going with whatever whatever we've got most of, ones or zeros. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. That's wrong. No, sorry, six. Six zeros and five ones. So the majority vote is a zero, and it will be wrong. Yep. So what is the point of all this? Uh, what I'm going to do, if I just flip the number of games to 2,000. We will see the noise. It'll take a bit longer. This noise will uh, disappear. So, yeah, so the more basic games you have, the more you come to a kind of constant value. So what's this saying? So common sense says if you've got 11 people, each with a 60% chance of winning a game, my logic would say that if you took the majority vote, you'd still only get 60%, yeah? But that's just not true. <laughs> so, the majority vote will take your, basically, from a 0.6% win rate to a 0.75% win rate, without actually having to think about it. 
Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Now you might think 0 0.6 to 0.7, whatever, is not that great. What did I say? Is 0.51. Like 0.51 is a rank bad tips to you. They only get, get 51 games out of 100 correct. They get 50 just by random guessing. Now hopefully, when this finishes, you'll see we still get a game. We still go from 0.51 to 0.527. Now, that might not seem a lot, but trust me, in the stock market, that's going to make a lot of difference. Actually, it drops. Sorry? It drops. 0.529 to 0.527. That's like... That the accuracy has dropped. Yeah, the accuracy dropped. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, yeah, if you've got any questions, don't be afraid to uh, shout out. Or if you want me to just hurry up, show up and start drinking beer, just let me know as well. <laughs> okay, so... What, what I'm using Alpha is just a simulation. I, I didn't have to check. I didn't have to generate. I didn't have to go to Betfair or whatever and ask for the load of results. I could use R to s simulate uh, that process. And it's kind of told me that one plus one is sometimes three, which is what I wanted to know. Now, this is the same simulation, but for those who probably don't know that much about R or not deep into it, delved into it deeply. What, what I'm doing is simulating 200 seasons. Now each of these seasons is, a, is an ind independent simulation. Now I can do those, uh, if I've got enough computers I could do all 200 at once. So I just want to, just in case anybody doesn't know, you can parallel, parallelize R. Uh, now I use a function called Snowfall, which is simple network of workstations. And I think there's now, reading last week, I think there's something in base art called par parallel. Yeah? So, what I'm going to do, just to prove to it works, uh, if I go like that, that's my, that's my laptop. I've got about quite a, few pros quite a few cores. If I just run that using this parallel algorithm, you should. Once it starts going parallel, you see, you know, all, all cores are, are doing everything in parallel. And that's going to save me a lot of time. So this is just a, an aside, I guess. Now, there you go. So the point of that was, you know, you can speed things up. Now, I'm, I'm currently working at a company where if I'd have done things sequentially, it would have taken me over a month. Because I've got, basically got unlimited hardware. Uh, I've kind of cut that down to a day, uh, just because I've been doing things in front. Okay. So that's footy tipping. So, how do we, how do we win a footy tipping? So, we, or, we organise a footy tipping competition. Yeah? So we get lots and lots of people to join in. And when the season started, we kind of figure out who are the good people. Yeah? And we combine their predictions, and then we go down to the bookmakers and put a, you know, take their majority vote, uh, and it will be a pretty good, pretty good bet. Yeah. So we're not actually coming up with our own algorithm. We're piggybacking off a lot of good people. Yeah. Who've now these people will. They won't have picked. There are there are different ways of picking their teams. So some people, oh, I'll just go for the home game, home team. Others might do really fancy stuff like look at who's injured, and you know, others might just like the colour of the strip. Others might you know, fancy the captain. I don't know. But a lot, everyone will be putting together their algorithm in a bit of a different way, so they're all slightly different. And those, everyone will have their good bit, and when we combine them over the season, it, it, it will work quite well. So there's a bit of a flaw in that. That. So, what about something more complicated? So, that was just a binary outcome, and what it what it assumed was that everyone's predictions were totally uncorrelated. Yeah. So, there's no correlation at all between everyone's predictions. Now, that doesn't happen in the real world. 
uh, most predictions are continuous, and sometimes there's the correlation between predictions is not zero. Okay, so we'll jump back to R. So I've got another simulation here. Uh, model synergy. So now, I'm trying to hear average models, but I don't have the time and effort to build a load of models. Now, I'm only actually interested in the error, so I can use, I can actually, rather than build a model and create an error, I can just generate the error in the first place, yeah, randomly, and, and it will, I will see what it happens. So, there's a nice, I'll run, I'll run this simulation, let's see what happens. Okay. So what I've done, in my parameters, I've said I've got that many cases. I've randomly generated two sets of errors, and I've basically said each error will have a, a mean squared error of one. And what, this so is a continuous error, so this is a root mean squared error. So just by, after, I'm just, I've just said then created an average error, just added the two, divided by two, and you'll see just the model average of two errors gives an improvement. Uh, and you can see this chart, don't panic. <laughs> Okay, so the second chart basically shows you what's going on. So we've got basically two uncorrelated errors. Now there could be a few thousand of those, this many, but this is the first 25. And the red and the blue lines are the errors for each case, and the green is just the average. So you see that the green line always sits in between the red and the blue. And this is the error distribution. So model one, which is a random model, is got a wide distribution. Uh, the, the bluey one, which is, you can see that the error distribution's shrunk in. And this fourth one uh, basically says that those two models, we've got the random, they're totally uncorrelated. Yeah? So this is not typical. So what we need to do now is introduce some measure of correlation. Okay, now, when I was doing this week, I needed a way of correlating, creating a random number, create another random number that's correlated to it, yeah? Now, I'm, as I said, I'm no mathematician, but just going to Stack Overflow, someone had already written me a nice function, so I didn't have to worry about it, I just plucked that out, put in a function, did a bit of tweaking, and away we go. So what I can do now is, I can change the relative correlations between these these two sets of errors. So let's go and see what happens. Okay, I've got a worseness factor as well, so it means one model is going to be 1.3 times higher RMSE than the other. So, okay, so what is this graph? Okay, so I've specified two models that are always going to have the same error, one and 1.3. But what I'm going to do is in, I'll start off at zero. Oh, so we start off at the far end. At the far end, both basically they're perfectly correlated. So essentially, each prediction is the same. Yeah. So the average is just going to be the average of the two essentially. Now, as we reduce the correlation between those two models, uh, we get to a point here where this just straight average is actually better than the best. Yeah. And as we get down to zero, so an average of 1.3 and 1 will give us quite a good boost. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, so, so the, the rule is here. If we're going to average two models, we want them as uncorrelated as possible. If, we, if, if we've got two models that are identical, obviously averaging is going to end up with the same. So we're, we're up this end. Yeah, so when we're building models, we want a boost, we want to find uncorrelated models. Okay, does that, does that make sense? And did everyone know that already? Probably. <laughs> okay. So to me this, it's not very intuitive. So, I mean, I've always, 
I've done a few software vendor courses for software, so we've got the best algorithms. We've got a, an automated best algorithm finder uh, that tests 10 algorithms and finds the best one. And I've challenged a few people to say, well, just take the average of the 10 and tell me if it's any better. And they're always surprised. They're actually always like, they do it and are surprised. Oh, well, I, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so it is counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it's very intuitive. Uh, okay. Well, exactly. Well, that is a straight average. Yeah, that is the that is just 50-50. Now, obviously, some models will be better than others. So you want a weighted average. Yeah, that'll give you even better. So this is the worst case scenario. Yeah, 50-50. You don't really need to think about how you weight them. But if one if one metal if one model is way better than another, you'd say 0.8 of this model plus 0.2 of this model. Yeah. This is the same technique that uh, Nate Silver used, wasn't it, in uh, looking at the predictions of uh, election outcomes and so on? I've actually got Nate Silver's book on the side of my bed at the minute. It's called yeah. the, the Signal and the Noise. Yeah. I've not got page, past page two yet, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you'll, you'll get there. It's I, it was an aeroplane book, and I, I must have find alcohol on the aeroplane isn't it? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, this technique is basically if you want to win any predictive modeling competition or if you want to push the limits, you know, you, you've got to do this. You can't just rely on one algorithm. Okay. Uh, so, kind of a few takeouts. You can, have a, you can have a really rubbish model that you think, you know, you might build a model on independently that looks pretty rubbish. But don't disregard it because it, it might find, it might be looking at the data in a bit of a different way than the others and, and you know add something. Uh, and we find that in the Heritage Health Prize. We had this really rubbish random forest. It was just rubbish. But when we blended it, it added a massive amount because it, it was finding something that the other models hadn't. You know. uh, so you know it might have been correlated and blended well. Okay, so, how do we build uncorrelated models? Well, I mean, the first one is use a different algorithm. Each algorithm is like looking at the data in a different way. So GBM looks at data in a different way than a neural net and an SVM. It, you know, it finds its equation completely differently. Uh, and the other way is, don't know, mess around with your data. So, one technique that the team used in in the Heritage Prize was, say you've got cohorts of data, say you've got data about what drugs you take, data about your, age, your demographics, your age, your gender, data about uh, the conditions you had. They would build a, they would stick with, they, they stuck with one algorithm, but didn't, in, in, in each model, they didn't give the algorithm all the information. So say, say one, one bit of, say one piece of information is very strong, an algorithm would always hone in on that bit of information, yeah? If we remove that information, it will have to find something else, yeah? The, you know, it, will, it will find different patterns, it will have to figure out a way for itself to look at the data a bit differently. Now what you don't want to do, and a lot of people do do, and, and I've made the mistake a lot, you pick one algorithm, one data set, and just try and tune, 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 tune the parameters and get that minuscule uh, gain. That will get you a good individual algorithm, but all your succession of algorithm tweaking, they'll all be very, 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 very correlated, so they won't blend well together. So what you better do is, rather than trying to beat the death out of one algorithm, get a good, get to a good point, move on to the next one, yeah. Okay. Now, as I said, proof of the pudding's in the eating. Uh, that was just a simulation, so, in 2007, there was a, a PAC DD, just like an annual conference that used to have a competition, and it was about cross sell models for home loans. So there were 47 entries. Each entry had to de describe their method. Now, this was the days when people just went, people were trying to prove they had the best algorithm. So, my normal net, that's my prediction, my decision tree, yeah, I think my decision tree is very accurate. So. These were the, this was also the days where people were, were 
investigating you know, this model averaging. And people used to, in, in their papers, they say, oh, I used R and built 30 different models. Now, I just, don't, I just didn't have the, the energy to do that. No, I didn't know R at the time. So I think it's much more sensible just to ask the organizers, you've got 47 people there, you've built me 47 different models. Uh, can I have the results, please? I'll tell you, you know, what would have happened if we'd have ensembled them. So basically the answer was, if we'd have took the kind of 27 best models and just take a straight average, you know, add them all up, divide by 27, that would have won the competition. Uh, if we'd have taken the top 40, we'd have come first runner up. And what I did then was I kind of randomly, I, I, I selected subsets of five models and averaged them. And find which combination of five entries would have given the best performance. Now, the kind of interesting, well, not interesting, but the obvious thing now I know is that these five entries use seven different algorithms. So it's a mixture of seven different algorithms that would have won by a long, long, long way. And the you know, number five of that group was individually ranked 22. So that kind of is the point again, they might have one really bad one, but don't discount it because it, it will could add to the blend. Uh, okay, so this is my conclusion. Uh, <laughs> this is all my. I've got Tiberius.biz webpage, and this this kind of report on this competition is there. So my competition was: if you're a marketing person, and you want a good model, just ask ten people to build ten different models and just average them, and you won't go far wrong. You know, don't. Then someone who comes to you saying, I've got the best model, don't be leaving. In order to pick those five models that would have won, yeah. did you actually uh, use the, the, the testing data to do that, or did you use the same data that they had available? To it was their prediction that, so it was, it was what retrospectively what would have been the best combination. It wasn't if I'd have known it beforehand, it was retrospective, yeah? Okay. So what they did, they, they, they submitted predictions, yeah? And I just basically took what they submitted, their predictions. But did you optimize over the, um, the data that was used to test them? So like, did you also work out um, if you had have had their predicted models without the answers, as in without the, the test data, yeah. could you have figured no, out I, I didn't, which set I, no, you didn't do that? I, okay. I, all, all, the hard, all the data I had was what the actual prediction, that's all I had yet, so... Oh, right. Yeah, so I... Hold on, I'm still confused. So, did you have the data that, was, that they were tested on for the competition? Yes, yes. That was what you optimised over to select the file? Yes. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, if those five had got together and just taken a straight average, they would have won. That's the basic. Yeah, but they wouldn't have known that that was No, they wouldn't have known at the time, no. Right. But the, I guess the, 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 the find is that that there were seven, you know, there was a combination of algorithms that, that gave the biggest boost. Yeah. yeah, you know, three people did a GBM, they'd all be correlated, and there's no point you know, averaging through GBM, you, you need a variety. Yeah, okay, so tourism forecasting competition. So this is another cattle competition, and uh, what you had to do was you had a few hundred uh, time series you had to predict, and I use uh, Rob Heinemann's forecast package uh, and I knew nothing about his algorithms, I just knew that he built these algorithms for me for about five, four or five. Uh, and I was trying to figure out which was the best one to use. But what I noticed was you know, for any algorithm, if you look, when I, when I basically, I'm a very visual person, I like to look, look at pictures. When you plot the picture, an algorithm might be really good, but now and again, you'd have this way, way, way bad prediction that was quite visibly just, just wrong. Now, now the idiot mentality is well. I've got four, I've got three other algorithms here that for that particular point, their their prediction is quite quite okay. So, from a a safety position, say you're in you know credit risk or whatever, don't put all your eggs in one basket. From a safety pure safety position, taking an average of four is going to not give you that bad error on the one. It's going to hedge, hedge yourself a bit about about really bad errors. And that technique, I mean, that technique is 
basically, it's, it gives you the, the most accurate model anyway, if you, if you weight them correctly. So but my, my, my approach is it's, it's from a defensive point of view, but it also works as, as a improving accuracy. Okay. Now the last bit of Arno, we're talking about variable importance. So uh, sometimes you get a massive data set and there might be thousands of variables and you've got to figure out which ones are important. Yeah. Now you might have I can have kind of thousands of columns. Say you've got uh, a, a medical code. There could be a thousand things wrong with you. You might turn that into binary flag. So you've got a thousand columns, one not, have you got this, this condition? Yeah, so you can end up with a, a lot of variables. Now, a lot of those will be just pure rubbish. Now, you don't want to be, you don't want to be building models on just loads and loads of data because it takes you forever. Uh, so what you want to do is a way of picking out the useful ones. Uh, and then, so what you'll do, you'll sample. If you've got a million rows, you'll take a sample of a thousand, do the variable importance, pick the good ones, reduce the number of columns, but then use you know, the million. Uh, and variable point, it also helps interpret because most of these algorithms are just you know, black boxes. But if you've got, if you've got a way of, a kind of, a way of knowing the variable importance, it gives you a bit of intuition that the model's actually working. So, is there a independent, an algorithm independent method that we use in any algorithm to figure out how important the variables are? Does anyone know of any? Just as a, no? Visual inspection. Sorry? Visual inspection. Visual inspection. How do you do that with the GBM? <laughs> or if, is that, what, what do people use? I mean, from a psychology perspective, you tend to try to work from theory, from theory yeah. uh, and understand what the likely uh, relationships are between variables from extrapolating from previous research that's been done or a model you may have around what the, what's so you, driving the behaviour. So you have a hypothesis that you try and prove or disprove. That is correct. Right. This is machine learning. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I know there are ways you can do it, but yeah. you can also do it from a... Okay. Well, I'll show you what, what, what you can do. Okay. So... Going back to our uh, health thing again, so we've got a few load of variables about about a person. We've built our algorithm, yeah. So we've we've got a GBM neural network. Doesn't matter what it is, and it's it's going to make a prediction for us. So, how do we find out which of these variables are contributing to that model and which which aren't? So, what you do? Take each variable in turn, yeah? Say age is one variable, you, you mix it around. So, say I've got 100 people, you don't give me my exact age, you give me Eugene's age, yeah? You, you take the same distribution, or shuffle them, yeah? And then you pass, these are all as is, and one of the variables is, is, is stuffed up, and you say, what is the change in the error if that variable is not what it is, it's just something random essentially. Yeah. So if the error doesn't change, basically that means that variable is irrelevant to the mod that model. Yeah. <coughs> so we could we could have just put a random age in, yeah, and we would have seen no difference. If that if age is very important, the error will uh, increase, yeah. So it, what it means is that the, the algorithm has to know the age of the person. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. I think. Okay. We will now demo that in R. And I'll show you the function I wrote. We can actually do that. So this is the last uh, demo, and then we'll go and have some beer. Okay. So what I've got here is just a little function that builds four models. And I've called them linear regression, neural network, GBM, random forest. Yeah. And I'm going to simulate some data based on random numbers. I'm going to make 10 of the variables important and 10 of the variables totally relevant. Yeah. And just the way I've, I've simulated the data, I'm going to make it just a linear addition. So it's perfectly solvable by linear regression. So we'd hope linear regression can solve it. 
and my kind of, uh, so that generates the data set, and then this is the main function, that's the main line of code that's kind of the important thing, so we've got a particular variable, and we just order it randomly, yeah? So we're stuffing up the distribution and, and passing it through the model, seeing what happens to the prediction. Now you, you do that, you can't just do it once, you've got to do it lots and lots of times to get stability. And you do it on the test set, yeah? So I've divided the R into training test. So here's what happens. Hopefully. So, the, just so you know, the way I've done the data set, useful one is the most important, useful 10 is the 10th most important, and junk are just irrelevant. Yeah? Uh, pieces, are, pieces are right, so we'll crack on. So, what, what, what's happened here? So, the first of all, the linear regression model. So, the green line is the test set, which is really the one we're interested in, and the, and the white line is the actual data we're built on. So, it's Basically, if you're at zero, stuffing around with that variable has no effect on the error. Yeah? If, uh, and the worst one is scaled from 0 to 1 now, so the best useful one is the one that gives the most changing error, and it's kind of scaled linearly now to useful 10. So basically what this useful linear regression is basically perfectly trained, perfectly tested, which is no surprise because that's the way I made the data, and it's perfectly ranked the variable importance. Uh, so now, neural net. Neural net, for those who don't know, is very, not much different to kind of, it's just the neural net in its most basic format is linear regression. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of not much different from a, from a functional point of view. And this has got one, two, three, four, five, it's kind of got a bit confused between six, five, and seven, but and also it's kind of thought that some of the junk variables were, were important, mainly on the train set. So you can see they're a bit both fitting. The others, uh, sorry, so the test is green. It's the test set for these is totally decided they're useless, uh, but it's, it's done okay. It's kind of on the job. So here's a G. Does everyone know what GBM is? Yeah. If you don't, you should go and find out because uh, you, want, you want accurate algorithms. If there's any one algorithm you want to choose and you only want to stick one algorithm, you can't really be a, a gradient boosting machine. Uh, but it's, it's, it's like a tree, it's more of a decision tree type, type, type way of looking at the data, so it deals with interaction as well. Uh, so what the GBM has done, it's got, it's found the same on the and it's not really done as well with the junk variables, but it's going to rank order incorrectly. And here's the random forest. Now you see the, the error on the random forest is really bad. Now, what you can't do here is look at the train error on the random forest. You've really got to concentrate on the test error, uh, which is the green line. <coughs> so it has completely eliminated uh, these variables down here, but it's giving some importance to some of the junk variables. Okay, so so what? You know, so we've got a thousand variables, and we want to reduce the number of variables we've got. So what what I would do is essentially do what I've done there, because you, you you don't know the functional form of your data. You don't know whether it's going to be a linear regression or a decision tree, or you know you don't know quite how the data fits together. But all the algorithms. Uh, should be kind of directionally correct. So what I've done here, I've, I've done a voting system, so each of the four algorithms gets a vote for uh, an unimportant variable, so this is the one kind of where it, it applies a zero, you know, of zero in importance. And you see the two at the end, all four algorithms are voting for it. Uh, these four here, three of the algorithms have, and at least, you know, to the neural net and the linear regression, you know, they, they're quite, you know, they, they can solve that problem. So they, they, 
picked up the rest. What I think, so that's the only important variable, so you, you chuck that out. <coughs> and last slide. Sorry. So this, this is the kind of rank averaging of importance. So basically taking a, an average rank for each algorithm. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's quite good. So 1 means they all voted for it. So each algorithm thought useful one was the most important. And number 2 and number 3. They got a bit confused between 4, 5 and 6. Now that's, that's quite understandable because we look at the here, so 4, 5 and 6 have got very, very similar coefficients, so it's not really surprising that it can't thoroughly rank all of them. Uh, and what's more important, they've all put the jump ones at the end. Okay, so that is a technique I use quite a lot, just basically to uh, get rid of rubbish. Is that, did anyone learn anything there, or is that completely over your head or just something you already knew or? <laughs> I learned something from that. Yeah, that was good. So you would start in that case with 20 variables, build the model and work out some, and then would you pick 15 or 10 or something and build a new model? Uh, this is not about model, well, you know, the way I do it in my software, Tiberius, what it does, it does that process, it then eliminates one. Right. It starts again. Okay. Yeah. Limit another, or you can specify how many, and it's like a, a loop process until every variable on the test set shows it's important. Because you can like probably eliminate three at once, and might have a bit, might be a bit of a compound effect. So I just delimit, I'll eliminate one, start again. Right, nearly there now. So we're going to talk about the Heritage Hell Prize, and literally this will be two minutes. So this was a two year competition to improve healthcare and win three million. And the goal was basically to identify patients who will be admitted to hospital within the next year using historical claims data. So over a thousand teams entered and there was a milestone every six months just to keep people interested. Uh, um, the team I was in, uh, well the teams I were in because our teams grew over time, we won milestone one, milestone two and we came the overall Winner, or technically we weren't the winners because uh, our models weren't accurate enough to beat the specified benchmark. So we were, we were best so far than it claimed to be. Uh, so what the actual data they gave us? So we're doing three years of data. So you give year one information, and what how many days in hospital in year two? Year two, how many days in hospital? Year three. And then we're given year three, and we had to what well, basically had to predict what was going to happen in year four. So I woke up one morning, and uh, <laughs> because of the I'm in Australia, and this was based in America, I happened to just stumble across the fact that the data had been released and no one had entered, apart from you know well Anthony Goldblum, he he put up a test submission. So I thought, oh. Got a chance to be the top of the leaderboard here because no one else has entered. So I kind of downloaded the data, submitted a submission. So I've submitted within an hour, well, basically been 10 minutes of waking up to be honest, and I was top of the leaderboard. And I thought, oh, I've got to, got to brag about this. Uh, who's online? Who can I tell? Look, I'm winning the HHL price. So I found my mate Dave, right? Dave's a guy who lives in Florida who's, I've been doing, working with him a lot in predictive competitions. I said, Dave, look, I'm top of the Heritage Health Prize, and I didn't, I haven't even downloaded the data yet. I just downloaded it, I just suddenly played random numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, what is it, 20, 20 minutes later, Dave, Dave, Dave's, Dave's a bit cleverer at random number generation than me. <laughs> so that's, how it all, that's kind of how it all started. So me and Dave had this thing going on, uh, more of a private competition, yeah? So we kind of, they shot straight to the top of the leaderboard. I was more slow and steady. I was working through the variables, gradually growing my data set. You know, I was waiting a lot of time, to be honest. Uh, but eventually, we both reached a place where we kind of plateaued at the same score, like top 10-ish. And we thought, okay, I'm getting over this now. He's, he's, uh, I'm probably going over now. Let's, let's 
I can just average our scores and see what happens. All right? So we averaged our scores and we shot way to the top of the leaderboard, yeah? By, by a significant amount. And thought, oh, Dave, what did you do? So we, we kind of, our models were very uncorrelated, so we tried to figure out what we were doing different. So what we did was, I structured the data differently than Dave. So I'd taken year one to predict year two, year two to predict year three, yeah? What Dave had done, had combined year one and year two to predict year three. So he had more history, but less records. I had more records, but less history. Yeah, so it's just a different way of structuring the data. Uh, oh, by the way, Dave, yeah, Dave and Randy, mustn't, mustn't forget Randy. David. Randy's a, a clinician who Dave teamed up with to uh, get some, some medical information in, in his models. Uh, so that's basically the difference of, of, of our two approaches. It, was this, it wasn't it wasn't I built neural network, he built a GPM on the same data. We literally used completely different views of the data and it had a massive, massive synergy. Okay, so me, Dave and Randy teamed up for milestone one. We call ourselves market makers. So we won the milestone one with a, with a blend of 20 models. We then, what, what we then did, we then realized that I took Dave's data set. I built loads of loads of models on my data set. David kind of got one very accurate model on his data set. So I took his data set and built a load of models. Uh, and kind of, I got a bit carried away. And, uh, <laughs> we, we, had, uh, we won milestone two with 79 models in there. And for milestone three, uh, we actually didn't do anything. We kept, this was a bit tactical, to be honest. We kept the same solution just to see if anyone had improved on us, uh, keeping a few cards up our sleeves. So in milestone three, we came third, yeah? So only two teams had leapfrogged us in six months. Uh, now, meanwhile, in, in Holland, or the Netherlands, uh, Willem, he came second in milestone one, and he just used a single algorithm. It was an algorithm we didn't have, and, he blended 21 models. So he was, his, his, his kind of, his method was don't really concentrate on one model building accurate, I'll build a, I'll build a, I'll use the same algorithm, different bits of data, and not really worry about how accurate each one is, and then just smash them all together. And it used for him. And he, he teamed up in Milestone 2 with Edward, and they still came second in Milestone 2. But then for Milestone 3, uh, they won milestone three. This was our milestone three where we actually didn't do anything. Not, I'm not saying that if we had done something, we would have beat them. Okay, now the third team in our final kind of team is Crescendo. Now, they didn't actually start to milestone three, they didn't actually start to like 30 days from the deadline. And they came second, and that was, um, everyone was thinking, who is this team? You know, wow, they must be. They must have some inside information here. Uh, what they did, when we, we kind of read the report, they used them, they had actually helped them develop the cell, uh, called Regularized Greedy Forests, which I would highly recommend uh, someone writing an art package for. And <laughs> 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 I can use it, but easy. Okay, so basically, after milestone three, we, we, we kind of combined to to uh, form PowerDoc, which is just our initials, the best word we can come up with, with our initials. Uh, we knew it was tied at the top because we knew, I knew Edward and Willow had made a minimal change and they leapfrogged us from our no change model. Uh, from the reports, we also knew our three submissions would be complementary, so joining forces was pretty much easy decision because literally we thought it would have been a toss of the coin and we were kind of hedging our bets, you know. Spent two years on this, didn't want it to be the toss of the coin, so we thought we'd eliminate the competition. But uh, we, you will be assimilated. Uh, so the milestone solutions were complementary, so there's basically a correlation like, across all three of 0.94, and the winning solution was one way of looking at the winning solution was a blend of 100 models. Yeah. So this is the first one. 
Mark came in today, didn't he? You're, you're, not, you're famous. <laughs> so this is the final leaderboard. So there's like a thousand teams. This is the top top 25, 26. Our final submission. I mean, there was a very significant difference between us and, and, and team two. Uh, so as I said, I've not told you everything. Uh, that's for part two and three, and I'm going to keep some secrets to myself. Uh, analytics inside. Eugene, stick your hand up. Yeah, so we've got another Melbourne guy there, and Ponic Melbourne. That's Mark there. That's, so we've got quite a good Melbourne contingent here. And uh, what I don't think anyone else from any, anyone else enter? No? Well, Mark, Mark gave up after about six months, didn't you? Yeah, so this guy here, he didn't do anything for a year and a half. Just think what he could have done if he had put a bit more effort in. <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, that was. Your team was actually a benchmark for me because I knew you weren't doing anything. So I used, I used your test scores as a gauge of. We got lucky. A lot of teams in front of us just merged and they kind of pulled us under rankings. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not that good, really. Okay. So this is, uh, this is our team. So four of us went to the presentation. And Will L. Reed was. Quite a genius of our team, to be honest. She was amazing. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the Heritage Health Bar story. The, the, the kind of stories they still want to give away three million, so there's going to be a part two. And what they're going to do there is, uh, in part one, the data was pretty well dumbed down for, for privacy issues. So we didn't actually know how old some was, was. We knew they were between 20 and 30, which not very good. Uh, so. There is going to be a part two where they're going to give us the actual fine detail data and it's going to be some sort of secure environment. So that's it for my talk. Now we need to crown the champion. Have we, have we got any results? Can you remind me what, what you want me to do? Oh. <laughs> I've done the agriculture So how many people did we get into? 40, 38. 38? It didn't come around. Yeah, it didn't come around. Ah. Who's not? Who's not had a guess? Right. Let's just send it around here, boss. What we'll do, we'll send it around there. Have a beer and a pizza, and I'll tell the answers in about ten minutes. Okay? Is that good? Pardon? Yeah. You're just going to hide from Collins. Ah. I want those Collins. So someone is going to be crowned the Melbourne Predictive Analytics guessing. Guessing the way to. Uh, to so this, that basically concludes my uh, talk. Uh, I think we're all hungry. Maybe we'll, take, maybe we'll take questions. Yeah. And start the pizzas. At the same time. No. No. Questions first. Right. You talk about waiting. Uh, so how do we weight the models? I mean, this is going to be part two and three of the algorithm. Now, the, the actual competition. When I said I run the pack, the, the no, I run the uh, also the M competition. Now, that competition, I got all the data. Did everyone hear of the Netflix prize? So my, my kind of problem to solve was how do I best average all these models? So I've got a, high, a lot of highly correlated models, what's the best way to weigh them? Because obviously the more highly correlated they are, you've got a big issue uh, with some algorithms trying to, trying to weigh them. So that competition was about, I got all the predictions from the Netflix prize from the winning two teams, made them available and said who can blend these best against what could have been. So if you go to my Tiberius.biz site, it uh, basically explains what the winners did. Uh, but you've got to be very careful about how we fit it. So if you do linear regression, you might have say, a thousand models or a hundred models. You pro uh, what the winning teams will be doing is ridge regression. So you penalise large coefficients. Yeah? And we did something similar but a bit different, which was we did kind of random regressions. So rather than building a regression of 100 correlated variables, we randomly selected, say, 50%, built a regression, another 50%, so random combinations, 
And because of the way linear regression is, you just average the weights, you actually get end up with one equation. But that randomization has a regularization effect to stop getting large weights. And that that works tremendously. Okay. You use the uh, raw by you something variable? Ah, it depends on the algorithm. For example, what I've what I discovered was the R package in neural the neural network package in R really you have got to normalise the data so they're all within the same range and standard deviation. If you've got decision trees it's irrelevant because it's just a decision boundary, it's just a cut-off point, so it depends on the algorithm itself. But because when you shuffle variables, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the variable importance? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's irrelevant because it's, it's from the same distribution, yeah? So, so we're all in here aged 20 to 60, whatever. The, the, the magnitude of it, the whole age range is going to be the same, the, or the, the range. It's just that rather than me being 20, I might get 35, yeah? So it's, it doesn't, normalization in that doesn't, is it, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Um, with these kind of competitions, they usually try to find new variables that are not in the data to give you the edge? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say any more about that. If you, yeah, if you read, they haven't made our milestone three, sorry, our final report will go into detail about that but they've not made it they've not released it yet so I'm, I'm keeping quiet because it's our secret <laughs> how do we test that how do you test the so I can't hear you how do we know the model it's all the models are not correlated how do you know they're not correlated yeah any simple method to, to see that? Well, you, you, you take the predictions and calculate the correlation between the predictions. Yeah? So just one line in R. So you predict for one model, predict for another model, calculate the correlation coefficient. Yeah? And be between 0 and 1, I think. And uh, I guess your final uh, algorithm uh, uh, winning final one. No, no, the final winning algorithm was a hundred different models. Yeah, but most of them, most of them from GBM. No? No? No. So, I mean, what, what we found with the GBM was the GBM was the single most accurate algorithm, yeah? But building five GBMs on the same data set would not be very, very correlated, so... Yeah. So you have the equal amount of... Uh, yeah, what, what we had to do was go through all our hundred predictions and... <coughs> Pick out. I kind of manually went through. Well, manually went through them and got rid of the ones that are essentially the same. Yeah. Um, if you so, do you have a well-defined formula that you commonly use to to weight uh, the difference in correlation between different models and their their relative accuracy to come up with a weighting um, for each model in your aggregate? No. <laughs> so you just do it like. So what method do you use to decide how to weight them? Oh, it's essentially just a linear regression, or a, a, a ridge regression, or as I said, a random regression. Yeah? Over the model? Over the predictions. So what you'll do, you'll, you'll build a model on, say, you'll build a model on, say, 80% of your data, you'll make a prediction on 20%, and you'll use the 20, these predictions from the 20% to, to best. You, can, you can't blend, you can't weight them based on the data you've built the model on. It's got to be a prediction, and then you weigh it based on the predictions yeah. to find the, the final kind of weighting, essentially. So it's just a linear, linear weighting. Yeah. With your remote correlated ones. So are you using yes. both the information about the, the correlations between them as well as the information about their accuracy? Uh, you don't have to. I mean, the way we did it with the random stuff, the random, random linear stuff, yeah. you don't really have to worry about correlated, but I did, uh, you know, you, you, do, you don't really want correlated variables in your linear regression, because it'll give you unstable weights. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of made sure that the big list of 100, <coughs> there weren't variables that were highly correlated, there weren't okay. predictions that were very, so, very highly so you, correlated. So you manually um, filtered out the models for ones that were as uncorrelated as possible? And then well, kind of manually, but it was kind of semi-automated. Semi yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. But we just didn't want 
same thing. Two models are the same. There's no point having them both in. Of course. Yeah. But you don't have a, a system that automatically, as in like, the, the linear regression model is going to do worse if you have lots of models that are highly correlated, and, right? So you, you want to get rid of the correlated yes, one yes. before using linear regression. Yes. Yeah, sure. Is everyone done? You want as much variety as possible. Right. Oh. On a diff yeah, kind of different. So you mentioned you had your computer, you got one computer for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. But can you give us an idea of the hardware that was involved in your solutions for heritage? Maybe I mean there's lots of teams, but even just your team. My what, particular. What were you using overall? Oh, well the hardware. Just a. I went down to the computer shop and said, I want. The main, I started off with a 32-bit machine. The main criteria was I needed more RAM, because in our, everything's in RAM. I think we've got 16-gig 16, 16 of RAM. And so, so it was just, so you just did a, all your stuff on just one machine. Just, you didn't have another 20 no, machines? No, no, just, just a desktop, oh. desktop PC. Okay. Just, uh, what are your tips on uh, data preparation? Uh, tips on data preparation? Okay, so one of the th one of the things we spotted in this data was this. I'll give you one tip. One. Anyone else need a break? There's three years worth of data, right? Yeah. And things change in time, yeah. So you've got to make sure the distributions. Say you've got a variable which is there's one variable called days to payment or something, and in the first two years it was the same distribution. It obviously changed the form or the the, the rules. In the third year this day since payment had a totally different distribution. They don't, you know, so we actually can't use that variable. Some rule, something's changed in the underlying way they do things. Essentially the rules have changed. So you've got to make sure that from your train, your test, and your score sets, the distributions of each variable look the same. If one's massively changed, your model's not going to work. Yeah? So either do something to calibrate it, or just don't use that variable at all. So that's kind of one thing you've got to look out for is consistency through time. Uh, other tips. My other tips now are I'm <coughs> it doesn't have to be a competition itself. Like in, general. Uh, in general, for any competition, visualization is my main. That the biggest. I I, I mean I, I do a lot of consulting and get data sets that people have no clue about. The first thing I do is plot histograms of all the variables. And you always spot weird crap going on, yeah? Uh, I've got a blog, I started a blog when I started this competition called another data mining blog or something like that. And in one of the blog posts I, I kind of give three examples where just visually inspecting the data points you to things that you've never, you never discovered like looking at statistical numbers, yeah? You've got to physically, physically look at it. Uh, so, yeah, look at it, visualization, and and you can quite quickly do that in R just by writing a script just to plot all the distributions you know, and looking for things that just don't look right. And normally, if it doesn't look right, it isn't. And you go back to the business, and they'll tell you what happened. And uh, they'll say, "Oh, well, sorry, <laughs> I can only work with what you give me. It's rubbish, it's rubbish, and rubbish." Yeah? You only use R, uh, yeah? Uh, for the competition, I actually started off with the data in SQL Server. Uh, so I mean another language, like Python? Oh, I mean, I can, on my website, I, philbriley.com, I, I write neural net codes, and I've got neural nets in about 12 different languages, from Java to Fortran <coughs> to VB to Perl to whatever. So, to me, I mean, Using a different language is just, as long as you can think logically, the language is irrelevant. It's knowing what you want to do. You can always then look a, look a bit about how that language actually works. So but at the moment, you know, I'm kind of tr still struggling to get my head around R. Uh, I mean, everyone's talking about Python these days. Until I've got the need to use it, I mean, I have no idea. You know? until, until it can do something that I can't do, or someone says, I need this job to do Python, I'll go ahead and learn it. But, until that need arrives, is I won't bother. Um, if there is one resource that you would recommend in learning R, what would it be? Uh, good question. 
I was actually watching what results? Stack Overflow. Uh, I find you've got to have a problem to solve. Don't just go and try and learn R. You've got to have a problem that you're interested in the answer to. Yeah, it makes it far more interesting. And then just kind of look at snippets of code. You know, I mean, I I can never remember R code, right? My I've literally the reason one of the reasons I started a blog was a place to put code because I never remember. I remember I, can, I remember I did something once, but no, no, can't remember what exactly I did. I just know I did it. I have to go and look at it. So to me, that's not a language I can memorize. I know I know I can do stuff. I'm then going to go and Google to figure out what the exact syntax is. Uh, but yeah, have a problem you're interested in the answer to, and you know, just try to solve it. Just, don't just try and run them in the for no particular reason. Yeah. Is your model actually being used? Model, the model is useless, right? Now here's why. Why, why do you want to? Why do you want to predict if someone's going to go to hospital? Yeah. So you can do something about it. Yeah. My, I always will be very accurate, but God help the person who's got to figure out why it's come to that conclusion. It's just a smash together. Nothing, you know, it's completely uninterpretable, right? It's, it's accurate, yeah, proved it's the most accurate, but from the organizer's competition, it's pointless, right? <laughs> it really is. <laughs> there was one team which jumped ahead using about 14 models plus correlations. Right. Uh, I shouldn't say correlations, but calibrators. Calibrators. And I was curious as to what was the approach in calibrating right. Okay, what a calibrator is, as I said before, things we're predicting one year ahead here, things change, yeah? You know, average admission rate. For example, say the doctor now decides if you're pregnant, you've got to stay in hospital three days rather than two. The rules have changed. Now our model's going to be wrong, and we don't know about that future information. The only information we've got is feedback from the leaderboard. So basically we would guess uh, things that have changed. So we'd, we might have a, a one zero flag for are you pregnant or something, yeah? And we, we, we had a technique to basically, I won't call it cheating, but everyone was doing it, but looking into the future. So these calibrators were basically things that have changed in the future. And we had a, by getting our feedback from the leaderboard, we had a way of knowing which ones were, were significant. It totally, Unusable in a real world scenario. Yeah. So is, that, is that basic backcasting from outcome data? And they were calibrating going backwards from outcomes, which in the real world you can't. You, can't you, you can never apply it in the real world, but in the real world you'd never. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were peeking into the future from the leaderboard feedback, trying to see what things had changed. Uh, I mean, we wrote about that in our report, so everyone could have cottoned on to the idea. But as again, you know, Pointless. <laughs> but it was an academic challenge, yeah? And it worked. <laughs> I think we're better off after this is getting called and we need to announce the winner. But I'm going to sneak one more in. Right. If I can. Um, what's life after the Health Heritage Fund? The Heritage Health Fund. <laughs> so now I uh, work for a hedge fund and then my, I've just set up a new analytics company in Melbourne with partner, business partner Dave over there. So watch this space. More so. as well. Uh, I'm kind of over them to be honest now. The, yeah, unless the prize is significant. <laughs> okay, well let's thank Phil. We do have a winner, we've got it spot on. Whoa. Um, the combined weight is 176 kilograms. You're not, you're not getting to know how that's split between yes. <laughs> <laughs> five is here on that one. <laughs> and uh, Stephen Hogg got it spot on. Uh, 176.0. Point zero. Point zero. Who's Stephen Hogg? Oh, what did right. I say? Right. Stephen Hogg. Right. Uh, there's quite a few after that who came very close. Um, what did I call? Sorry? What did I call? What, what, what is your prediction? I'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> The average? Uh, the average is 173.52. What's the median? The median is 168. And what was the final? The actual is 176. 
So the average. So basically, the whole point of, the whole point of this was to talk about ensemble. So my my prediction. I'm taking all you as my experts, and I'm just going to take an average of your scores, and hopefully I'll beat most of you. And it's like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not good at guessing weight, but each of you is. So I said the whole point of it was, to, I was hoping that the average would be spot on, but not quite. It's pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, so you beat most people. I you beat about, um, yeah, about. The average probably would have done better if everyone was guessing independently. So yes. Yeah. 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 So I came 10th. So that kind of demonstrates that my message really. Yeah. I came 10th without having to do anything. And uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to, I'm, I mean, I'm going to donate $5,000 to the Cambodian Children's Trust, uh, thanks to all your help. Uh, and what's, what's, what's your name? Stephen is going to get hundred dollars from me, and he's uh, until until next year he's the current the reigning champion. <laughs> <laughs>